welcome to Three Count Commentaries. Let's talk about SmackDown from January 20th, 2023. Well, I hope you like tag team wrestling because there's, there's a lot of that on here. Uh, a whole lot. The entire first round of the SmackDown tag team tournament happened in one night. Uh, I, it's okay, I guess. The Roman Reigns saga continues in his continued manipulation of Sami Zayn. And, um, of course, there is more Bray Wyatt shenanigans. <laughs> so, um, SmackDown was okay. It was all right. But that's only if you really like tag team wrestling. Um, because the, the Roman Reigns stuff really, mm, it was okay. Let's talk about that first because I know that's what everybody cares about. So the show opens with um, Sami Zayn meeting Roman in the parking lot. He sort of offers up the fist bump, but uh, Roman is not interested. He's kind of got a sour attitude. And uh, Sami Zayn's like, oh, oh, what did I do? And uh, (laughs) um, so later in the show, uh, Sami Zayn wants to talk to make sure everything's cool. Make sure, you know, him and Roman are on the same page. Um, so Roman says that he saw Sami Zayn's expression last week and, uh, he wants to know the truth. What is Sami Zayn feeling? What's the truth? So Sami Zayn says, look, he just wanted to take care of Kevin Owens. Felt kind of slighted because he didn't know the Usos were going to be there. He didn't know the plan. Just wanted to know what was going on. And so he says, you know, Kevin Owens has been talking about him feeling news, getting news and everything. And for a split second, and it's like that, that, that. He said it felt like he was going to say maybe he's right or whatever. But Roman got upset and just said, like, look, get out. You know, when does when does the tribal chief have to run his plan by the honorary use? Like, when did that happen? Then uh, he told him, like, just go find your own bloodline. You know, go find Kevin Owens. You know, I was just like, ugh. These, uh... These real bitch tendencies from Roman Reigns right here is is hilarious. Like the the jealousy, the uh, the paranoia. This of course continues along the line of you know Roman Reigns. You want to be me? Like want to be me? Uh, it's kind of continuing along in those lines. But you know the bitch tendency of you know kind of just having an attitude about this whole thing is oh uh, it's so weird. It's it's weird because it's fitting. You know, that's the, that's the scarier part about it is that it's actually, (laughs) it's pretty fitting for the character to have, um, a sort of attitude, you know, you know, he's being questioned. It's not, he's not, he's being misunderstood, but he also, he's just being questioned and Sami Zayn's just like, Hey man, you know, let me know what's going on. And Roman Reigns is like, who the hell are you? You know, I don't, I don't want to answer no, no questions to you. So, uh, later on, Roman Reigns is still flummoxed after he put out Sami Zayn. And, you know, he's like, he just can't believe this guy. <laughs> so, Paul Heyman is like, oh, I never liked him anyway. Because <laughs> you know how Paul Heyman is. Then he says he looks at things not personally, but as a special counsel. And as special counsel, he thinks it's better for... Sami Zayn to be inside the castle pissing out and outside the castle pissing in considering they're about to sign a contract to wrestle this man's best friend. And of course, this is this is the soap part of uh, of SmackDown. The soap part of SmackDown was pretty good because now we see that, you know, Heyman is, of course, impeccably two-faced. He's great buddies with Sami Zayn when, when it's necessary. But when Sami Zayn is not around, this is kind of how he talks about him. That, you know, he is using him. It's better to keep him here so that he can't help Kevin Owens than, you know, him being on the outside where he might be able to help Kevin Owens. So, uh, Roman sends Heyman to, to fetch Sami Zayn once again. Uh, Sami Zayn, of course, is brought back and Roman does what he does once again, the abused the abusive husband uh, angle. He he tells Sami Zayn that he has a temper. And that's why Heyman is there. Heyman is there to counsel his anger. To make sure it doesn't really get out of control. 
And Sami Zayn's like, oh, I, I completely understand. But, you know, he, he now, um, after talking to Heyman, Roman Reigns realized that Sami Zayn just wants to be part of the team. He's thinking of the details. He's a perfectionist, just like I am. You remind me of me. And Sami Zayn's like, yeah, 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 absolutely. Which is, you know, a problem. You shouldn't remind Roman of Roman. You know, we're a lot alike, you and I. After he just accused you of wanting to be him like a week or two ago. Mm. But same thing, uh, just is like going along to get along. Same thing, like, yeah, yeah, sure, you're right. Absolutely, you are correct. I'm just, I'm just a profession. I just want to know what's going on, man. It's, like, it's no big deal. And, you know, Roman Reigns just says, uh, you know, I just expect the love and the loyalty that I give to others. I just expect that back, you know, like that's all. And Sami Zayn's sitting there like, oh, no, come on, man. We'd do anything for you. We all love you, man. You know, I will always put the bloodline first. Whatever it takes, I will put the bloodline first. I will do whatever you need me to do. And so, and so, uh, Roman Reigns gives him an errand. Kind of a ridiculous errand, considering, you know, Sami Zayn is uh, a professional wrestler. But now he's pretty much a coffee boy. You know, he's like, Roman's like, look, I need you to go get the Usos. I need you to go, you know, uh, get our, set up the, the travel arrangements. Make sure that the pilot is in the airplane. There's gas in the airplane. There's gas in the cars. You know, I need you to go take care of that for me. And Sammy's saying, it's like, okay, okay, sure. Whatever you say, boss. You know, um, he's a hopping bob at this point. This is ridiculous. And, uh, <laughs> He uh he puts out his fist as Roman you know sends him on his mission, and uh, Roman looks at the fist, looks at Sammy, and said, "I guess I owe you one." And fist bumped, and the crowd popped on the fist bump. By the way, so people who are watching us, they pop, uh, and then Sammy Zayn is off to do his uh, his errand. Uh, at this point, there's the contract signing, which I completely forgot about. I forgot it was a contract signing. He goes, no, I think Kevin Owens actually did sign the contract, but it was pretty much a fight scene. Roman gets in the ring. He sits at the head of the table, puts his feet up. Uh, Solo is there to protect him. Uh, Kevin Owens just attacks. He didn't bother to do too much else. <laughs> he just snatched uh, Solo out of the ring. And then he, you know, uh, gave a stunner to uh, Roman Reigns. Uh, the Usos were there post haste to help out. They ended up getting beat up. So once again, Kevin Owens fights up, fights up uh, three huge men, four huge men by himself. He pretty much beats up the Usos and Solo Sokoa. Um, then he power bombs Roman through a chair, not through a chair. I'm sorry, through a table. Uh, pop up power bomb too. I actually like that move far more as a finisher for Kevin Owens and that stunner. I get it, you know. Um, Sometimes it doesn't make sense for him to power bomb some people because they're so big, but I, I just felt like that was more his move, you know, than um, that stunner. It's every time I see somebody do the stunner, I just think Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know. Anyway, uh, Sami Zayn comes running out there after Roman has already put through a table, so it took Sami Zayn several minutes to get out there, and he's a little late. The Usos were out there before Sami Zayn was out there. Uh, Kevin Owens takes the contract from a whining <laughs> Paul Heyman, uh, signs the contract. And once Sami Zayn comes out there, Kevin Owens actually flees and jumps the uh, barricade into the crowd. So he doesn't even fight Sami Zayn. And Sami Zayn's like, what? What's going on, man? And just kind of didn't pursue him to fight him either. So you, you get this this element of, you know, you ask, start asking the question, like, where was Sami Zayn? Because remember, Sami Zayn was supposed to collect the Usos. They were supposed to be together. So, if the Usos got down here, where was Sami? You know, so that's going to be the next element, the next question. And, uh, this is really good thematic, almost novel type of writing here. It's not comic book writing, even though there's some elements of that to it. There is a lot of uh, sort of novel elements where one chapter just asks a question 
and then the next chapter has to answer it. So in this chapter, of course, you have the is Sami Zayn so brainwashed into the bloodline that he doesn't see that Roman is constantly manipulating his feelings, you know, which is what, you know, what Roman did to the Usos constantly playing with their heads, constantly messing around with them. He's doing, now doing that to Sami Zayn. You know, he's pushing Sami Zayn away to to test whether Sami Zayn really wants to be in the group. And since he does, because Sami Zayn is delusional, um, it's it's working out on Roman's behalf. The more that they try to kick you out of the cult, the more that you want to be in it. You know, uh, so... <laughs> Uh, Roman is brainwashing the hell out of uh, Sami Zayn. But now you see these elements that Sami Zayn, you know, the brainwashing isn't working 100%. You know, last week it was Sami Zayn feeling sympathy for Kevin Owens. There's also a slight bewilderment to the idea that he was supposed to handle Kevin Owens himself. And it ended up being uh, the Usos who took and Solo Sokoa who took care of that. And Kevin Owens kind of throwing this little uh, Hail Mary at, you know, he, when he grabbed Sami Zayn's boots, which I didn't notice. And, you know, that was one of those things where I think it was more noticed by super nerds who, you know, go, are going frame by frame. And, you know, they managed to catch Kevin Owens sort of pleadingly grabbing Sami Zayn by the boot. You know, to show that there's, a, there's still that connection between the two guys. And this week it was, all right, so what's the relationship between Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn? Well, they, they fight each other, so it's not personal. Um, and Kevin Owens still wants Sami Zayn to sort of snap out of it. So with that being said, he's not going to aggravate Sami Zayn too much. You know, um, he's just kind of going to let Sami, let it simmer. But he also knows the mind game. You know, he knows that Roman is just using Sammy. Uh, so it's an interesting scenario to see that it took Sami Zayn so long to get to the ring after Roman was attacked. And of course, next week is going to be um, where were you? You know, when we when Solo got taken out, when Roman got stunned, where was Sammy? You know, the Usos are going to be like, where were you? You know, and Sammy's going to be like, but, you know, you told me to do something. I was doing what you told me to do, and I wasn't there. And it's going to get turned on him anyway because he should have been there. And that's going to be a nice little element. But it's it seems like they really are building towards the end of this angle. Um, I think the Paul Heyman, Roman Reigns conversation where Heyman is basically like he never really liked him anyway. <laughs> I think that is going to end up being the uh, the the big deal. That once they're done with Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn is going to be done too. And uh, we're still <laughs> we're still sitting back waiting. I think that's really good stuff because you kind of you see it coming, you know it's coming. It better come uh, in terms of the Sami Zayn beatdown. You know the thorough drubbing he's going to get on. The bloodline. This is not a time to subvert expectations where some people are like, what if Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens are really working together, man? Like, wouldn't that be a nice twist? I'm like, yeah, but it make Roman look stupid. And um, it, it would take all of the air out of the story. You know, and what everybody wants is a underdog baby face in Sami Zayn, you know, because they then they want the, the giant buildup of. Sami Zayn was part of this huge heel group. He was a terrorist because they were terrorists. And then over time, he sort of smartens up and he realizes that he was used. And he starts, you know, what did what, using what he knows about them to fight them. Of course, that ends in a tag team championship, which is, you know, a great little theme here because that was the, the uh, storyline for the night outside of the Roman Reigns stuff was tag team wrestling. So they gave you this wonderful little uh, peek into the future of uh, tag teams with Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. Also, you had the Usos there. There is some, there's some stuff here. It's really tight, tight writing on SmackDown. So the Roman Reigns stuff was very good, as usual. 
Um, could it have been better? Maybe, but I'm glad he didn't turn it into a generic contract signing. At the same time, they just had to uh, promote Roman Reigns to be in the building. It didn't matter what Roman really did. He just had to be there. <laughs> you know, like Roman just had to, you know, be in the building. So it was fine. I, I actually, I'm loving the bloodline stuff, man. Like it's so layered in terms of their storytelling and what they're doing. Like, it, you know, the characters have, and this is what, when I tell people like the, the automaton wrestling where characters come out and they have no relationships, relationships are part of the story. You need to have characters with relationships because then you can start pulling strings. The, this works specifically because Sami Zayn and Kevin Owen are friends. The Usos, you know, Solo Sokoa, Roman Reigns, these are blood-related guys. But Sami Zayn is friends with the with the bloodline. So, but what's more important? Sami Zayn is he's being pulled in two directions. You know, that's the thing about Sami Zayn. You know, is there anything particularly special about Sami Zayn that you know uh, where? he matters to that point. You know, usually when you have a guy who's sitting in between two friend groups, it's something special about him. But with Sami Zayn, he's kind of like a sidekick to Kevin Owens, but he's also like a sidekick to Roman Reigns and Roman Reigns, you know, doesn't need the Kevin Owens thing. He doesn't even want that anywhere near him. So Sami Zayn's in a situation where he's being you know, pulled in two directions. And, it's been fun to watch, you know, there's nothing particularly special about Sami Zayn, but you do know the relationship between him and Kevin Owens and what Kevin Owens winning the title would mean to him, you know, as his friend and that sort of thing. But you also have the layer of the Sami Zayn character that he's been delusional since 2019. And that's something that I think that uh, most people are not paying attention to is that it's been several years of Sami Zayn just being off the rails. You know, uh, first he was the great liberator and he was a conspiracy theorist in 2020. It was 2020 exactly when he was protesting SmackDown saying that, you know, they were out to get him. And then Kevin Owens was part of that too. You know, <laughs> was it, was it, I think it was WrestleMania 2021. That would be 38, 37, where, uh, it was Kevin Owens versus Sami Zayn. And that's when they brought in Logan Paul because Sami Zayn was trying to get attention for his documentary that never came out. Um, I really wish there was a documentary. <laughs> so that it sort of started there, you know, even though it was a little bit before that. So Sami Zayn has been delusional for two or three years. And it's been a constant with Kevin Owens saying like, you know, nobody's out to get you. And then Sami's like, well, you're with them. And he's like, no, it's not, that's not what's happening. And this storyline is the same thing. It's Kevin Owens being the anchor. He's a source of reality for the utterly delusional Sami Zayn. And you see this push and this pull of these two characters and it's making it interesting because on the independence, I think it was basically Sami Zayn was the eternal good guy while Kevin Owens was the eternal heel. And this one, WWE, they have done a job of flipping it where now it's Kevin Owens is particularly usually the good guy in these situations while Sami Zayn is the bastard, but he's not like the most evil guy ever. He is just comedically, uh, off balance uh wrestler you know like he's just everything Sami Zayn does is comedic in nature so you're not supposed to take him super seriously but he wins enough and he's dangerous enough where you're supposed to take him seriously but they've done a good job of killing off certain elements of his character but keeping it the same you know like when he was delusional about the documentary they found a way of ending that angle while keeping that uh, Sami Zayn is crazy. And then they got they stopped that a little bit you know, at WrestleMania 38 when he lost to Johnny Knoxville. Um, that was a loss of his honor, a loss of his respect because he lost to a non-wrestler. So he's all about trying to get his respect back. And this led to him 
doing the bloodline thing. So this makes sense. And it's been a three or four year progression of this character. And this is long form storytelling. Long form storytelling isn't the same story all the way through all the time. Sometimes it is slight changes in character. Um, and even if you put the character in a different position or feuding with a different person or something like that, the character's story still exists, you know? So that's like Roman Reigns character continues to exist, whether he's feuding with Jay Uso, whether he's feuding with, um, Kevin Owens, whether he's feuding with, uh, anybody else, Brock Lesnar, the, the bloodline story existed throughout the entire entirety of this. Kevin Owens character has, you know, fluctuated a little bit, but him being the guy who wants to, you know, inject reality, you know, breaking down the wall of whoever he's dealing with, like the Ezekiel stuff where he's, you know, the only one who knows that Ezekiel is Elias. They're the same person. You know, it's the exact same thing he's been doing with Sami Zayn. You know, everybody's involved in this mass delusion that Ezekiel and Elias are two different people. But Kevin Owens knows that they're the same person, you know, and he's trying to tell everybody it's the same person. But because we like Ezekiel, it's like, no, nah, it's not the same person, you know. So you can look at these characters and you can take them individually and you can recognize that these characters are the same. This is a long form storytelling, you know, characters that don't change that often or they change subtly depending on the situation that you put them in. It's sort of sitcom writing. But it is a long form story because it's not blue sky. It's not you're resolving, uh, you're introducing a conflict and resolving it by the end of the show. You know, you're asking questions and then you put them in a new situation with new characters. And those characters are operate in this way. The, the character that you're focusing on operates in this way. And then you find ways to wrap those two things together. So this has been phenomenal. All right, let's get to this tag team thing. Let's be really quick with the tag team joint. All right, the Banger Bros defeated uh, the Viking Raiders. I guess they're calling them the Banger Bros, but it's Sheamus and Drew McIntyre. They won with the bro kick. Uh, this pretty physical match. Um, the, the, it, they announced, uh, I'm guessing through the dirt sheets, that the Usos will be defending these titles separately now. So, yay, it's official, I guess. Um, <laughs> Wade Barrett sort of... Uh, explain the character of Valhalla, Sarah Logan, by saying she's the she passes communications from the gods to the Viking Raiders. So she's their medium, their oracle, which is fine if they weren't job guys. <laughs> but they're job guys. I'll give them some credit. Uh, at least that the crowd got into this match. It was a little too long for me, but the crowd liked it. So uh, the Banger Bros move on. The second match in the tournament, Hit Row, they defeated Los Lotharios. Los Lotharios were looking tremendous here. Um, Top Dollar is still trying. He's trying very hard to be a, a good wrestler. Uh, some would say trying and failing. I would say he's just trying. <laughs> um, the finish came with a B-Fab distracting Umberto, uh, which led to a roll-up. Uh, they're going to be facing Drew McIntyre and Sheamus next week. I'll pretty much tell you how that's going to go. If they couldn't beat Los Lotharios clean, well, I don't know. Are Los Lotharios baby faces? Are they baby faces now? Do anybody care? I like these guys. And it seems like everybody else is kind of like shrug, you know, <laughs> they exist. <laughs> All right. Um, the third match in the tag team tournament, the Brawling Brutes, Ridge, Holland, and Butch. We're defeated by Imperium, uh, Giovanni Vinci, and Ludwig Kaiser. Uh, this match was very solid. Very work rate match. Again, a little long. Um, but it was good. You know, um, Imperium, you know, moving forward. You don't need two teams of Sheamus and his boys. You don't really need both of them. So this worked out for me. Reg Holland being the guy who took the pin 
weird, but the match was solid, just a little too long. Uh, the fourth match in the, in the tournament, the final first round match, Legado del Fantasma defeats the maximum male models. Um, it's fine, but this is sort of a, a heel program. Cause I'm like, are maximum male models heels or baby faces? Does it matter at this point? So <laughs> anyway, Legado del Fantasma won. At least it was short. That's the best thing about this. Maximum male models it actually sucks, but at least it was short. I heard they've been doing good character stuff on YouTube, on WWE YouTube, but it's not on TV. So it needs to be on TV. It's just like to be in the elite crap. If it's on YouTube, you're asking me to watch YouTube. I'm saying put it on SmackDown so people can see it. Um, maximum male models are dead in the water. Everybody knows that. Uh, they need to do something. Otherwise, just you could quietly release the two guys and put the girl somewhere else. But um, the next round will be Hit Row versus Sheamus and Drew McIntyre. That's pretty obvious what we're going in that direction. Uh, Legado del Fantasma versus Imperium. Now, that's going to be interesting considering, again, two heel teams. And uh, I wonder what direction they're going to go in with this. Uh, I don't know where you go. Maybe you would go Imperium because, you know, Gunter is involved with that. And maybe you want to threaten Imperium having the tag titles and the Intercontinental Championship. You know, maybe that would be cool. You know, I don't know. But the tournament's fine. Just some of the matches are getting a little long. A little, little long. And I'm not fond of the long matches, especially cold ones. And tournament matches are usually pretty cold. Um, I give a special uh, shrug to Viking Raiders versus Drew McIntyre and Sheamus because they did at least uh, put some heat on that by having the Viking Raiders attack them two weeks ago. But generally speaking, tournament matches are very cold, you know, especially when you just throw the tournament together, which is what they did, apparently, <laughs> you know, so um, but at least it's a tournament. It's, at least it's OK. I would like for them to do something for the Intercontinental Championship. Maybe a tournament there too, or a, a battle royal or something. Or they just did a tournament, I'm sorry. I mean, maybe a battle royal or something. How are we going to. And I'm thinking maybe uh, Gunter's next opponent is going to spin out of this tournament. Of this tournament. So maybe that's why Legado del Fantasma is the opponents for Imperium. Because maybe Santos Escobar and Gunter is the next way we're going. And we're going to have uh, Imperium win, but maybe Escobar and Gunter get into it. I would love that because I like Santos Escobar. All right. So, uh, LA Knight, he defeated a job guy. Great. Anyway, he, uh, cut a promo saying that, you know, he wanted the people to help Bray Wyatt figure out what's going on. Cause one minute he is Uncle Howdy, the next he's not. And he says, um, he could tell you who he is. And he says that he's going to, uh, make Bray Wyatt wish he had never come back. So <clears throat> then all of a sudden, you know, the Firefly Funhouse returns. All of the puppets are there. Wyatt's talking about how much he missed you and how much he had fun with you. Ramble and Rabbit is using uh, <laughs> uh, L.A. Knight's lingo. <laughs> Ray, let me talk to you. <laughs> uh, the Ramblin' Rabbit says that he likes L.A. Knight, that he's like the Miz with muscles. <laughs> He's like the fourth person to get compared to the Miz. It was like MJF is the Miz except Jewish. Uh, Grace Waller is the Miz except Australian. And now LA Knight is the Miz with muscles. <laughs> it's kind of like the Miz is the blueprint now for like a uh, cocky, talkative heel. Um, anyway, Ramblin' Rabbit is scared of the dark. And then uh, Bray Wyatt makes fun of L.A. Knight's name saying, like, what parent would name their child Los Angeles Knight? <laughs> Which, <laughs> yeah, well, why would you do that? Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, he then explains why people should be afraid of the dark. Um, then told L.A. Knight that you open the door so you are responsible for what comes through it. Um, okay, this is fine. It's a... Uh, a little confusing because I, th I thought we were done with this stuff. But considering there, the storyline has been that Ray Wyatt is trying to 
stay away from who he is or who he was. This is another reinvention of Bray Wyatt, which goes along with the first reinvention of Bray Wyatt. The first reinvention was when he started the Firefly Funhouse and he promised to never be the eater of worlds again. And he cut the uh, poster of him, not the poster, the cutout. He cut it in half and all that kind of stuff. He promised never to be that guy again. Um, of course, ended up not being, she ended up being something worse in The Fiend. And now he's come back and, he, you know, he's trying to enjoy his return and trying to be positive. But then you got L.A. Knight and you got Uncle Howdy and they're causing trouble. So Bray Wyatt is now slowly, slowly slipping back into who he is. So last week you had the rocking chair, sort of the eater of worlds thing. Um, he called himself the eater of worlds. He called himself Uncle Howdy, but you never really know because Bray Wyatt is talking in riddles all the time. But now the Firefly Funhouse is back. So you're you're getting the idea that Bray Wyatt is slowly but surely comfortably moving back into who he is and who he was before he was released. Um, <clears throat> and it's a nice little threat that they're dangling over the head of L.A. Knight because he doesn't know what to expect. So they gave you a glimpse that he could be the eater of worlds last week with the rocking chair. Now that they're kind of giving you the idea that it could be a fun house, Bray, because there's a fun house this week. And now they're probably going to tease the fiend at some point. So LA Knight is not sure who's going to come walking through the door. That's what, you know, the symbolism of the door is that LA Knight's going to be in the ring, unsure of who he's going to face. You know, he's going to fight some version of Bray Wyatt, but he's not sure which one it is. And, uh, and the audience doesn't know which one it is. So that's the cool element to it. If you're into this thing, there's a lot of people who are just kind of like, Oh, He's just speaking mumbo jumbo, man. What is he talking about, man? And uh, I get that part too. But I like the element of we don't know what to expect from Bray Wyatt because he hasn't wrestled on TV. I know he wrestled on house shows. He hasn't wrestled on TV yet. So we don't know if he's going to be the fiend or he's going to do sort of the eater of worlds thing or is it going to be something completely new and different? We don't know. And that element of we don't know is interesting in wrestling. It is, you know, why tell me when you have episodic television and if you, if I'm interested, I'll see, you know, the beautiful thing about that part is, is that even if I don't like Bray Wyatt, if I'm interested in the Roman Reigns stuff and I'm following that, the Bray Wyatt stuff is underneath that, you know? So if you want to watch Royal Rumble, just to see what's going to happen between Roman Reigns and Kevin Owens, you're still going to get that Bray Wyatt uh, information too. So you're really going to be able to see, even if you don't care about it, it's something that was on the show that has been built up and talked about. That's going to be paid off at the Royal rumble. So that ought to be something, right? It ought to be interesting to see. I'm thinking it's just going to be like a new version of Ray Wyatt. I don't think it's going to be the fiend or the eater of worlds. I think it's going to be something different. So I'm looking forward to, I don't, don't think it's uncle howdy either. Um, of course, more people are getting impatient over the who reveal Uncle Howdy, reveal who it is. But I think that the longer it takes for you to reveal, the less, I guess you could say the more it takes, the longer it takes, the more conspiracy theories people build up in their minds, the more likely you are to let people down because they're already thinking, okay, it's going to be this guy. It's going to be this guy. It's going to be this guy. And then when eventually it is happening and it is revealed, people are going to be like, that's it. You know, and it's, it's inevitable, (laughs) you know, it's inevitable that they act that way. But what else can you do? Uh, I say, just tell the story the way you want to tell it. And if people are disappointed, it's like what was going on with the cage. My man, what was his, uh, Eric Redbeard, you know, I don't know what they, I don't know. Uh, what was his name in WWE shit, whatever. But everybody wanted to know what was in the cage. And then it ended up being a spider in the cage. Well, the spider isn't a bad idea. It was just, I don't think it was a real spider, you know? And if it was a real spider, it'd have been fine, I think. I think it was a fake spider. Um, and plus, it was like, he was like shaking it like it was a rabbit dog in there or something like that. <laughs> but um, the longer it takes to reveal something, the more people build it up in their minds, the more likely you are to let them down. And but also, the longer you tease something, you know, you could tease things and people will, 
eventually get interested. But then you have this microwave society that we live in where they want answers immediately. It's like three weeks. Ah, you're dragging this thing out. Six weeks. And people are like, I don't even care anymore, man. You, you know what? I don't even care. I don't care who it is. This thing is just in this. Nine weeks, they're like, well, I want the end it. But then they also complain, we want long form stories. We want, you know, why are you doing things? Why are you rushing stuff? Why is, you know, it's, you know, it's ridiculous. All right, Charlotte. So Charlotte uh, called out Sonya Deville because Sonya Deville apparently got something to say to her. Sonya Deville came out there and t- to truncate this a little bit. Sonya Deville wants a title match. Charlotte doesn't think that she deserves one. Sonya Deville then tries to explain that she's a star, that she comes out there looking like a star every week. The people shut up when she speaks. Uh, and that, you know, it took six people to pull her off of Charlotte last week. And that this is just Charlotte's arrogance blinding her to the fact that she is clearly qualified to wrestle for the title. Charlotte um, says that, look, I already beat you. You think that you're a star. Are you saying everybody else isn't, which is a miscon, <laughs> which is not to what Sonya Deville said. But she's a, you know, are you saying that, you know, everybody else isn't? What makes you more special than them? And it says that um, if you want a title match, focus on winning the Royal Rumble, but I'll fight you right now. So, of course, they do the, oh, I'll fight you. Oh, no, I don't want to fight. Sonya Deville says, and she very intelligently says, I'm not fighting you. Because there's nothing in it for me. You know, I'm getting nothing out of this. So she refuses to fight Charlotte. Uh, Adam Pierce comes out there as Sonya Deville tries to sucker Charlotte into agreeing to a title match. And Adam Pierce is like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And while Adam Pierce is talking, Sonya Deville just decides she's going to wrist punch. <laughs> well, forearm shiver. Charlotte. I don't understand why people just don't throw punches. Just throw a punch. Um, she throws a forearm shiver and knocks Charlotte over and then runs, which I thought was hilarious. Uh, because now Adam Pierce is frustrated because why, what are you doing? You can't just hit people and run away, Sonya. You can't just do that. But she did it. Um, I like Sonya Deville, man. I don't, I don't understand why we're not doing more with her. Um, but her trying to convince everybody that she's a top contender. How about just showing people that she's a top contender? Um, this worked okay, though. You know, Charlotte has a baby face. Eh, I don't, hopefully this doesn't last much longer. <laughs> but um, I really like Sonya Deville. Okay, Lacey Evans, they're still showing vignettes for her return. Uh, there's been like two months of this. <clears throat> she was supposed to debut two weeks ago. And instead, they just debuted her new finisher, which apparently is not going to involve Sergeant Slaughter. And... Uh, but she's now using the term maggot a lot on Twitter and stuff. Just kind of messing with him. <laughs> but like I said last time, he's not a real Marine. So I just, and plus like, does Lacey Evans really, what did she really get out of Sergeant Slaughter being there <clears throat> outside of sort of the clout of hanging around a really, really old man. Sergeant Slaughter was, well, he's not, he wasn't really old when I was a kid because he was world champion when I was a kid. But by the year 2000, uh, Sergeant Slaughter was the guy that DX made fun of. He was a guy who ran out there to separate people from fights. And that was 2023. This was 20 years ago, where if you were, you know, 25 or something, like that, what the fuck do you know about Sergeant Slaughter? You know, you don't know shit about Sergeant Slaughter if you're under the age of 35. You know, <laughs> you don't know that much about Sergeant Slaughter. So, uh, adding him to, and so plus he's really old. He's like in the 70s, I think. So maybe not you know, manager age. It would be nice for him to make an appearance or a cameo on some of these vignettes though. But I think they really want to lean onto this uh, Lacey Evans being a legitimate uh, Marine. Now the question is, when is she actually going to debut? I don't think they even know. Um, she's clearly being built up. I'm guessing they're going to go heel with uh, Lacey Evans. And so Charlotte is a baby face. That could be something. Uh, the eyes of Lacey Evans winning the Royal Rumble, minimal, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think she even has a shot in hell to win the Royal Rumble. But she has to actually show up on TV first. Um, speaking of showing up on TV, Shayna Baszler, she's been disappearing for a while. Um, and she basically wanted you to imagine wrestling with one with, with a broken arm or a broken ankle or whatever. And uh, that's how she's going to fight in the Royal Rumble. 
and says that she's going to tear her opponents limb from limb or limb by limb. That's her thing now. Shayna Baszler vanished from television around the same time that uh, Ronda Rousey did, which is really unfortunate, but oh well. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, Karrion Cross had a promo. He says that uh, Rey Mysterio is um, trying to figure out whether he wants to be the greatest of all time or a family man, and he can't do both. And uh, he's usually excited for a match, but he can't get too excited to fight Rey Mysterio. But he was excited to fight in the Royal Rumble because he, he intends to win that. And uh, that's fine. This very short promo from Karrion Cross, it was okay. Um, so they touched on a lot of different things. Uh, I wonder, I wonder if anybody's going to complain. I didn't look, but I wonder if anybody complained about the lack of women's wrestling on this show. There was not one women's match on this show. Uh, and there was actually only three women featured Lacey Evans in a vignette, uh, and Charlotte and Sonya Deville. So there was no Liv Morgan this week. Uh, I think Shotzi's sister has cancer. Like, God damn. Since Shotzi, you know, signed to WWE, it's been nothing but just horrible shit. You know, it's just injuries and her dad dying. Our sister got cancer. It's like, if if this stuff wasn't legit, you would think Shotzi was like an 11 year old trying to get out of school. He was like, oh, but my back hurts. I can't go to school today. My back hurts. Oh, my tummy aches. My mom, my dad died for Christ's sake. I'm not going to school. My dad died. My sister's got bone cancer, man. You know, it's like, God damn. There's like a, so many, it's almost as if she, you know, made some kind of pact with Baphomet or something like that in order to get this contract. Like everything negative that has ever could happen to a person is now happening in shot. See, the moment she signs a WWE contract and gets on the main roster, like all the negative shit starts happening. Her back issues start flaring up and everything. It's like, God damn. But her not being on the show expected. There was no Raquel Rodriguez. There was nobody. So I wonder if people are going to bitch about that. But I'm thinking they're probably going to do something to focus on the women maybe in the next couple of weeks. Um, which I'm expecting maybe a big thing for the Royal Rumble next week. But the show was pretty solid. Um, the matches tied together because they were tournament matches. So... If you cared about the tournament, you cared about the seeding and who was going to be in it and who they're going to be wrestling next and that kind of th kind of thing, even though the matches themselves were pretty cold, with the exception of one. Uh, the Roman Reigns stuff was really good. The Charlotte stuff was meh. The Bray Wyatt stuff was okay. So it was a pretty, it was an okay episode of SmackDown if you cared about the matches. If you didn't care about the matches, then this was probably a miserable experience for you. You know, if that's the case, too bad. I'm sorry to hear that. All right. Like, share, subscribe. Thank you guys. And I'll talk to you guys later.